Chapter 5. The Industrial Arts. I have treated briefly of the noble arts, it remains to say something of the industrial arts. All classes of society in Egypt were, from an early period, imbued with the love of luxury, and with a taste for the beautiful, living or dead, the Egyptian desired to have jewels and costly amulets upon his person, and to be surrounded by choice furniture and elegant utensils. The objects of his daily use must be distinguished, if not by richness of material, at least by grace of form, and in order to satisfy his requirements, the clay, the stone, the metals, the woods, and other products of distant lands were laid under contribution. 1. Stone, clay, and glass. It is impossible to pass through a gallery of Egyptian antiquities without being surprised by the prodigious number of small objects in Pietra Dura which have survived till the present time. As yet we have found neither the diamond, the ruby, nor the sapphire, but with these exceptions, the domain of the lapidary was almost as extensive as at the present day. That domain included the amethyst, the emerald, the garnet, the aquamarine, the chrysoprase, the innumerable varieties of agate and jasper, lapis lazuli, felspar, obsidian, also various rocks, such as granite, serpentine, and porphyry, certain fossils, as yellow amber and some kinds of turquoise, organic remains, as coral, mother of pearl, and pearls, metallic ores and carbonates, such as hematite and malachite, and the calate, or oriental turquoise. These substances were for the most part cut in the shape of round, square, oval, spindle-shaped, pear-shaped, or lozenge-shaped beads. Strung in a range row above row, these beads were made into necklaces, and are picked up by myriads in the sands of the great cemeteries at Memphis, Ermin, Ekamem, and Abidus. The perfection with which many are cut, the deftness with which they are pierced, and the beauty of the polish, do honor to the craftsmen who made them, but their skill did not end here. With the point, saw, drill, and grindstone, they fashioned these materials into an infinity of shapes hearts, human fingers, serpents, animals, images of divinities. All these were amulets, and they were probably less valued for the charm of the workmanship than for the supernatural virtues which they were supposed to possess. The girdle buckle and carnelian, figure 210, symbolized the blood of Isis, and washed away the sins of the wearer. The frog, figure 211, was emblematic of renewed birth. The little lotus flower column and green felspar, figure 212, typified the divine gift of eternal youth. The wat, or sacred eye, figure 213, tied to the wrist or the arm by a slender string, protected against the evil eye, against words, spoken in envy or anger, and against the bites of serpents. Commerce dispersed. These objects throughout all parts of the ancient world, and many of them, especially those which represented the sacred beetle, were imitated abroad by the Phoenicians and Syrians, and by the craftsmen of Greece, Asia Minor, Etruria, and Sardinia. This insect was called Kepra in Egyptian, and its name was supposed to be derived from the root Kepra, to become, by an obvious play upon words, the beetle was made the emblem of terrestrial life, and of the successive becomings or developments of man in the life to come. The Scarabius Amulet, figure 214, is therefore a symbol of duration, present or future, and to where one was to provide against annihilation. A thousand mystic meanings were evolved from this first idea, each in some subtle sense connected with one or other of the daily acts or usages of life, so that scarabae were multiplied ad infinitum. They are found in all materials and sizes, some having hawks' heads, some with rams' heads, some with heads of men or bulls. Some are wrought or inscribed on the underside, others are left flat and plain underneath, and others again but vaguely recall the form of the insect, and are called scarabaeoids. These amulets are pierced longwise, the whole being large enough to admit the passage of a fine wire of bronze or silver, or of a thread, 
for suspension. The larger sort were regarded as images of the heart. These, having outspread wings attached, were fastened to the breast of the mummy, and are inscribed on the underside with a prayer during the hard knot, to bear witness against the deceased at the day of judgment. In order to be still more efficacious, some scenes of adoration were occasionally added to the formula, for example, the disc of the moon adorned by two apes upon the shoulder, two squatting figures of amen upon the wing sheaths, on the flat reverse, a representation of the boat of the sun, and below the boat, Osiris mummified, squatting between Isis and Nephthys, who overshadow him with their wings. The small scarabs, having begun as phylacteries, ended by becoming mere ornaments without any kind of religious meaning, just as crosses are now worn. Without thought of significance by the women of our own day, they were set as rings, as necklace pendants, as earrings, and as bracelets. The underside is often plain, but is more commonly ornamented with incised designs which involve no kind of modeling. Relief cutting, properly so called, as in cameo cutting, was unknown to Egyptian lapidaries before the Greek period. Scarabae in the subjects engraved on them have not as yet been fully classified and catalogued. 55. The subjects consist of simple combinations of lines, of scrolls, of interlacings without any precise signification, of symbols to which the owner attached a mysterious meaning, unknown to everyone but himself, of the names and titles of individuals, of royal ovals, which are historically interesting, of good wishes, of pious ejaculations, and of magic formulae. The earliest examples known date from the fourth dynasty, and are small and fine. Sometimes six dynasty scarabs are of obsidian and crystal, and early middle. Kingdom scarabs of amethyst, emerald, and even garnet. From the time of the 18 dynasty scarabs may be counted by millions, and the execution is more or less fine according to the hardness of the stone. This holds good for amulets of all kinds. The hippopotamus heads, the hearts, the bobbirds, p. 111, which one picks up at Todd, to the south of Thebes, are barely roughed out, the amethyst and green felspar of which they are made having presented an almost unconquerable resistance to the point saw, drill, and wheel. The belt buckles, angles, and headdress in red jasper, carnelian, and hematite are, on the contrary, finished to the minutest details, notwithstanding that carnelian and red jasper are even harder than green felspar. Lapis lazuli is insufficiently homogeneous, almost as hard as felspar, and seems as if it were incapable of being finely worked. Yet the Egyptians have used it for images of certain goddesses Isis, Nephthys, Nath, Seket, which are marvels of delicate cutting. The modeling of the forms is carried out as boldly as if the material were more trustworthy, and the features lose none of their excellence if examined under a magnifying glass. For the most part, however, a different treatment was adopted. Instead of lavishing high finish upon the relief, it was obtained in a more summary way, the details of individual parts being sacrificed to the general effect, those features of the face which project, and those which retire, are strongly accentuated. The thickness of the neck, the swell of the breast and shoulder, the slenderness of the waist, the fullness of the hips, are all exaggerated. The feet and hands are also slightly enlarged. This treatment is Based upon a system, the results being boldly and yet judiciously calculated. When the object has to be sculptured in miniature, a mathematical reduction of the model is not so happy in its effect as might be supposed. The head loses character, the neck looks too weak, the bust is reduced to a cylinder with a slightly uneven surface, the feet do not look strong enough to support the weight of the body, the principal lines are not sufficiently distinct from the Secondary lines. By suppressing most of the accessory forms in developing those most essential to the expression, the Egyptians steered clear of the danger of producing insignificant statuettes. The eye instinctively tones down whatever 
is too forcible, and supplies what is lacking. Thanks to these subtle devices of the ancient craftsmen, a tiny statuette of this or that divinity measuring scarcely an inch and a quarter in height, has almost the breadth and dignity of a colossus. The earthly goods of the gods and of the dead were mostly in solid stone. I have elsewhere described the little funerary obelisk, the altar bases, the statues, and the tables of offerings found in tombs of the ancient empire. These tables were made of alabaster and limestone during the pyramid period, of granite or red, sandstone under the Theban kings, and of basalt or serpentine from the time of the 26th dynasty. But the fashions were not canonical, all stones being found at all periods. Some offering tables are mere flat discs, or disc fairy, slightly hollowed. Others are rectangular, and are sculptured in relief with a service of loaves, vases, fruits, and quarters of beef and gazelle. In one instance, the offering table of Sichu the Libations, instead of running off, fell into a square basin which is marked off in divisions, showing the height of the Nile at the different seasons of the year in the reservoirs of Memphis, namely, 25 cubits in summer during the inundation, 23 in autumn and early winter, and 22 at the close of winter and in springtime. In these various patterns there was little beauty, yet one offering table, found at Sacra, is a real work of art. It is of alabaster. Two lions, standing side by side, support a sloping, rectangular tablet, whence the libation ran off by a small channel into a vase placed between the tails of the lions. The alabaster geese, found at Lisht are not without artistic merit. They are cut lengthwise down the middle, and hollowed out, in the fashion of a box. Those which I have seen, Elsewhere, and, generally speaking, all simulacre of offerings, as loaves, cakes, heads of oxen or gazelles, bunches of black grapes, and the like, and carved and painted limestone, are of doubtful taste and clumsy execution. They are not very common, and I have met with them only in tombs of the 5th and 12th dynasties. Canopic vases, on the contrary, were always carefully wrought. They were generally made in two kinds of stone, limestone and alabaster, but the heads which surmounted them were often of painted wood. The canopic faces of Pepe I are of alabaster, and those of a king buried in the southernmost pyramid at Lisht are also of alabaster, as are the human heads. Upon the lids, one, indeed, is of such fine execution that I can only compare it with that of the statue of Khafra. The most ancient funerary statuettes yet found those, namely, of the 11th. Dynasty are of alabaster, like the canopic faces, but from the time of the 13th dynasty, they were cut in compact limestone. The workmanship is very unequal in quality. Some are real chefs d'oeuvre, and reproduce the physiognomy of the deceased as faithfully as a portrait statue. Lastly, there are the perfume vases, which complete the list of objects found in temples and tombs. The names of these vases are far from being satisfactorily established, and most of the special designations furnished in the text remain as yet without equivalent in our language. The greater number were of alabaster, turned and polished. Some are heavy and ugly, figure 215, while others are distinguished by an elegance and diversity of form which do honor to the inventive talent of craftsmen. Many are spindle-shaped and pointed at the end, figure 216, or round. In the body, narrow in the neck, and flat at the bottom, figure 217. They are unornamented, except perhaps by two lotus butt handles, or two lions. Heads, or perhaps a little female head just at the rise of the neck, figure 218. The Smallest of these vases were not intended for liquids, but for pomades, medicinal ointments, and salves made with honey. Some of the more important series comprise large body flasks, with an upright cylindrical neck and a flat cover, figure 219. In these, the Egyptians kept the antimony powder with which they darkened their eyes and eyebrows. The coal pot was a universal toilet requisite, perhaps the only one commonly used by all. 
Classes of Society When designing it, the craftsman gave free play to his fancy, borrowing forms of men, plants, and animals for its adornment. Now it appears in the guise of a full-blown lotus, now it is a hedgehog, a hawk, a monkey clasping a column to his breast, or climbing up the side of a jar, a grotesque figure of the god Bess, a kneeling woman, who scooped out body, contained the powder, a young girl carrying a wine jar. Once started upon this path, the imagination of the artist knew no limits. As for materials, everything was made to serve and turn granite, diorite, breccia, red jade, alabaster, and soft limestone, which lent itself more readily to caprices of form. Finally, a still more plastic and facile substance clay, painted and glazed. It was not for one of material that the art of modeling and baking clays failed. To be as fully developed in Egypt as in Greece, the valley of the Nile is rich in a fine and ductile potter's clay, with which the happiest results might have been achieved, had the native craftsmen taken the trouble to prepare it with due care. Metals and hard stone were, however, always preferred for objects of luxury. The potter was fain, therefore, to be content with supplying only the commonest needs of household and daily life. He was wont to take whatever clay happened to be nearest to the place where he was working, and this clay was habitually badly washed, badly kneaded, and fashioned with the finger upon a primitive. Will worked by the hand. The firing was equally careless. Some pieces were barely heated at all, and melted if they came into contact with water, while others were as hard as tiles. All tombs of the ancient empire contained vases of a red or yellow ware, often mixed, like the clay of bricks, with finely chopped straw or weeds. These are mostly large solid jars with oval bodies, short necks, and wide mouths, but having neither foot nor handles. With them are also found pipkins and pots, in which to store the dead man's provisions, bowls more or less shallow, and flat plates, such as are still used by the fellaheen, the poorer. Folks sometimes buried miniature table and kitchen services with their dead, as being less costly than full-sized vessels. The surface is seldom glazed, seldom smooth and lustrous, but is ordinarily covered with a coat of whitish, unbaked paint, which scales off at a touch. Upon this surface there is neither incised design, nor ornament and relief, nor any kind of inscription, but merely some four or five parallel lines in red, black, or yellow, round the neck. The pottery of the earliest Theban dynasties which I have collected at El. Kazam and Gebelin is more carefully wrought than the pottery of the Memphite period. It may be classified under two heads. The first comprises plain, smooth-bodied vases, black below and dark red above. On examining Thizera were broken, we see that the color was mixed with the clay during the kneading, and that the two zones were separately prepared, roughly joined, and then uniformly glazed. The second class comprises vases of various and sometimes eccentric forms, molded of red or tawny clay. Some are large cylinders closed at one end, others are flat, others oblong and boat-shaped, others, like cruets, joined together two and two, yet with no channel of communication 56. Figure 220. The ornamentation is carried over the whole surface, and generally consists of straight parallel lines, cross lines, zigzags, dotted lines, or small crosses and lines in geometrical combination, all these patterns being in white when the ground is red, or in reddish-brown when the ground is yellow or whitish. Now and then we find figures of men and animals interspersed among the geometrical combinations. The drawing is rude, almost childish, and it is difficult to tell whether the subjects represent herds of antelopes or scenes of gazelle hunting. The craftsmen who produced these rude attempts were nevertheless contemporary with the artists who decorated the rock-cut tombs at Beni Hassan. As regards the period of Egypt's great military conquests, the Theban tombs of that age have supplied objects enough to stock a museum of pottery but unfortunately the types are very uninteresting. To begin with, 
We find handmade sepulchral statuettes modeled in summary fashion. From an oblong lump of clay, a pinch of the craftsman's fingers brought out the nose, two tiny knobs and two little stumps, separately modeled and stuck on, represented the eyes and arms. The better sort of figures were pressed in molds of baked clay, of which several specimens have been found. They were generally molded in one piece, then lightly touched up, then baked, and lastly, on coming out of the oven, were painted red, yellow, or white, and inscribed with a pen. Some are of very good style, and almost equal those made in limestone. The Ushimshu of the scribe Hori, and those of the priest Horuda, say it found at Hawara, show what the Egyptians could have achieved in this branch of the art if they had cared to cultivate it. Funerary cones were objects purely devotional, and the most consummate art could have done nothing to make them elegant. A funerary cone consists of a long, conical mass of clay, stamped at the larger end with a few rows of hieroglyphs stating the name, parentage, and titles of the deceased, the whole surface being coated with a whitish wash. These are simulacra of votive cakes intended for the eternal nourishment of the double. Many of the vases buried in tombs of this period are painted to imitate alabaster, granite, basalt, bronze, and even gold, and were cheap substitutes for those vases made in precious materials which wealthy mourners were wont to lavish on their dead. Among those especially intended to contain water or flowers, some are covered with designs drawn in red and black, figure 221, such as concentric lines and circles. Figure 222, meanders, religious emblems, figure 223, cross lines, resembling network, festoons of flowers and buds, and long leafy stems carried, downward from the neck to the body of the vase, and upward from the body of the vase to the neck. Those in the tomb of Senegma were decorated on one side, with a large necklace, or collar, like the collars found upon mummies, painted in. Very bright colors to simulate natural flowers or enamels. Canopic vases in baked clay, though rarely met with under the 18th dynasty, became more and more common as the prosperity of Thebes declined. The heads upon the lids are for the most part prettily turned, especially the human heads. 57, modeled with the hand, scooped out to diminish the weight, and then slowly baked. Each was finally painted with the colors especially pertaining to the genius whose head was represented. Towards the time of the 20th dynasty, it became customary to enclose the bodies of sacred animals and vases of this type. Those found near Ikamim contain jackals and hawks, those of Sakura are devoted to serpents, eggs, and mummified rats. Those of Abidus hold the sacred ibis. These last are by far the finest. On the body of the vase, the protecting goddess Quid is depicted with outspread wings, while Horus and Thoth are seen presenting the bandage in the unguent face, the whole subject being painted in blue and red upon a white ground. From the time of the Greek domination, the national poverty being always on the increase, baked clay was much used for coffins as well as for canopic vases. In the Isthmus of Suez, at Anas al Medine, and the Fayum, at Asuan, and in Nubio, we find whole cemeteries in which the sarcophagi are made of baked clay. Some are like oblong boxes rounded at each end, with a saddleback lid. Some are in human form, but barbarous in style, the heads being surmounted by a pudding-shaped imitation of the ancient Egyptian headdress, and the features, indicated by two or three strokes of the modeling tool or the thumb. Two little lumps of clay stuck awkwardly upon the breast indicate the coffin of a woman. Even in these last days of Egyptian civilization, it was only the coarsest objects, which were left of the natural hue of the baked clay. As of old, the surfaces were, as a rule, overlaid with a coat of color, or with a richly gilded glaze. Glass was known to the Egyptians from the remotest period, in glass blowing, is represented in tombs which date from some thousands of years before our era. Figure 224. The Craftsman Seated before the furnace, takes up a small quantity of the fused substance upon the end of his cane and blows it circumspectly, taking 
Care to keep in contact with the flame, so that it may not harden during the operation. Chemical analysis shows the constituent parts of Egyptian glass too have been nearly identical with our own, but it contains, besides silex, lime, alumina, and soda, a relatively large proportion of extraneous substances, as copper, oxide of iron, and oxide of manganese, which they apparently knew not how to eliminate. Hence Egyptian glass is scarcely ever colorless, but inclines to an uncertain shade of yellow or green. Some well-made pieces are so utterly decomposed that they flake away, or fall to iridescent dust, at the lightest touch. Others have suffered little from time or damp, but are streaky and full of bubbles. A few are, however, perfectly homogeneous and limpid, colorless. Glass was not esteemed by the Egyptians as it is by ourselves, whether opaque or transparent, they preferred it colored. The dyes were obtained by mixing metallic oxides with the ordinary ingredients, that is to say, copper and cobalt. For the blues, copper is for the greens, manganese for the violets and browns, iron for the yellows, and lead or tin for the whites. One variety of red contains 30% of bronze, and becomes coated with verdigris if exposed to damp. All this chemistry was empirical, and acquired by instinct. Finding the necessary elements at hand, or being supplied with them from a distance, they made use of them at hazard, and without being too certain of obtaining the effects they sought. Many of their most harmonious combinations were due to accident, and they could not reproduce them at will. The masses which they obtained by these unscientific means were nevertheless of very considerable dimensions. The classic authors tell of steely, sarcophagi, and columns made in one piece. Ordinarily, however, glass was used only for small objects, and, above all, for counterfeiting precious stones. However cheaply they may have been sold in the Egyptian market, these small objects were not accessible to all the world. The glassworkers imitated the emerald, jasper, lapis lazuli, and carnelian to such perfection that even now we are sometimes embarrassed to distinguish the real stones from the false. The glass was pressed into molds, made of stone or limestone cut to the forms required, as beads, discs, rings, pendants, rods, and plaques covered with figures of men and animals, gods and goddesses. Eyes and eyebrows for the faces of statues in stone or bronze were likewise made of glass, as also bracelets. Glass was inserted into the hollows of incised hieroglyphs, and hieroglyphs were also cut out in glass. In this manner, whole inscriptions were composed, and let into wood, stone, or metal. The two mummy cases which enclosed the body of Nedim, mother of the pharaoh, her or semen, are decorated in this style except the headdress of the effigy. In some minor details, these cases are gilded all over, the text in the principal part of the ornamentation being formed of glass enamels, which stand out in brilliant contrast with the dead gold ground. Many fine mummies were coated with plaster or stucco, the text in religious designs, which are generally painted, being formed of glass enamels encrusted upon the surface of the plaster. Some of the largest subjects are made of pieces of glass joined together and retouched with the chisel, in imitation of bar leaf. Thus the face, hands, and feet of the goddess Ma are done in turquoise blue, her headdress in dark blue, her feather in alternate stripes of blue and yellow, and her raiment in deep red. Upon a wooden shrine recently discovered in the neighborhood of Daphne, 58, and upon a fragment of mummy case in the Museum of Turin, the hieroglyphic forms of many colored glass are inlaid upon the somber ground of the wood, the general effect being inconceivably rich and brilliant. Glass, filigrees, engraved glass, cut glass, soldered glass, glass imitations of wood, of straw, and of string, were all known to the Egyptians of old. I have under my Hand at this present moment a square rod formed of innumerable threads off colored glass fused into one solid body, which gives the royal oval of one of the Umenum hats at the part where it is cut through. 
the design is carried through the whole length of the rod, and wherever that rod may be cut, the royal oval reappears. 59. One glass case in the Giza Museum is entirely stocked with small objects in colored glass. Here we see an ape on all fours, smelling some large fruit which lies upon the ground, yonder, a woman's head, front face, upon a white or green ground surrounded by a red border. Most of the plaques represent only rosettes, stars, and single flowers or posies. One of the smallest represents a black and white apis walking, the work being so delicate that it loses none of its effect under the magnifying glass. The greater number of these objects date from, and after, the first Sayyid dynasty, but excavations in Thebes and Tel El Amarna have proved that the manufacture of Colored glass prevailed in Egypt earlier than the 10th century before our era. At Kernet Murray and Sheikh Abd el Gurney, there have been found, not only amulets for the use of the dead, such as colonnettes, hearts, mystic eyes, hippopotami walking erect, and ducks in pairs, done in party colored pastes, blue, red, and yellow, but also vases of a type which we have been accustomed to regard as a Phoenician and Cypriot manufacture. 60, here, for example, is a little Enaco of a light blue semi-opaque glass, figure 225, the inscription and name of Thothams three, the ovals on the neck, and the palm fronds on the body of the vase being in yellow. Here again is a lenticular file, three and a quarter inches in height, figure 226, the ground color of a deep ocean blue, admirably pure and intense upon which a firm leaf pattern in yellow stands out, both boldly and delicately. A yellow thread runs round the rim, and two little handles of light green are attached to the neck. A miniature amphora of the same height, figure 227, is of a dark, semi-transparent olive green, a zone of blue and yellow zigzags, bounded above and below by yellow bands, and circles the body of the vase at the part of its largest circumference. The handles are pale green, and the thread round the lip is pale blue. Princess Nessie Kanzu had beside her, in the vault at Deir El. Bahari, some glass goblets of similar work. Seven were in whole colors, light. Green and blue, four were of black glass spotted with white, one only was. Decorated with many colored fronds arranged in two rows, figure 228. The National glass works were therefore in full operation during the time of the great Theban dynasties. Huge piles of scoria mixed with slag yet marked the spot. Where their furnaces were stationed at Tel El Amarna, the Ramesseum, at El Kav, and at the Tel of Eshmanan. The Egyptians also enameled stone. One half at least of the scarabae. Cylinders and amulets contained in our museums are of limestone or schist. Covered with a colored glaze. Doubtless the common clay seemed to them inappropriate to this kind of decoration, for they substituted in its place various sorts of earth some white and sandy, another sort brown and fine, which they obtained by the pulverization of a particular kind of limestone found in the neighborhood of Kenne, Luxor, and Ajuan, and a third sort, reddish in tone, and mixed with powdered sandstone and brick dust. These various substances are known by the equally inexact names of Egyptian porcelain and Egyptian faience. The oldest specimens, which are hardly glazed at all, are coated with an excessively thin slip. This vitreous matter has, however, generally settled into the hollows of the hieroglyphs or figures, where its luster stands out in strong contrast with the dead surface of the surrounding parts. The color most Frequently in use under the ancient dynasties was green, but yellow, red, brown, violet, and blue were not disdained. 61. Blue predominated in the Theban factories from the earliest beginning of the Middle Empire. This blue was brilliant, yet tender, an imitation of turquoise or lapis lazuli. The Giza Museum formerly contained three hippopotamuses of this shade, discovered in the tomb. Of an int 62, at draw bull nege 63, one was lying down, the two others were standing in the marshes, 
their bodies being covered by the potter with pen and ink sketches of reeds and lotus plants, amid which hover birds and butterflies. Figure 229. This was his naive way of depicting the animal amid his natural surroundings. The blue is splendid, and we must overleap twenty centuries before we again find so pure a color among the funerary statuettes of Dear El Bahari. Green reappears under the Sayyid dynasties, but paler than that of more ancient times, and it prevailed in the north of Egypt, at Memphis, Bubastis, and Say. Without entirely banishing the blue, the other colors before mentioned were in current use for not more than four or five centuries, that is to say, from the time of Amis I to the time of the Ramesides. It was then, and only then, that a shoo of white or red glaze, rosettes and lotus flowers in yellow, red, and violet, and party-colored coal pots abounded. The potters of the time of Amenhotep III affected grays and violets, the olive-shaped amulets which are inscribed with the names of this pharaoh and the princesses of his family are decorated with pale blue hieroglyphs upon a delicate mauve ground. The vase of queen tea in the Giza collection is of gray and blue, with ornaments in two colors round the neck. The fabrication of many colored enamels seems to have attained its greatest development under Quainanan, at all events, it was at Tel El Amarna that I found the brightest and most delicately fashioned specimens, such as yellow, green, and violet rings, blue and white florets, fish, lutes, figs, and bunches of grapes. 64. One little statuette of horse has a red face and a blue body, a ring. Bezel bears the name of a king and violet upon a ground of light blue. However, restricted the space, the various colors are laden with so sure a hand that they never run one into the other, but stand out separately and vividly. A vase to contain antimony powder, chased and mounted on a pierced stand, is glazed with reddish-brown, figure 230. Another, in the shape of a mitered hawk, is blue picked out with black spots. It belonged of old to Amis I. A third, hollowed out of the body of an energetic little hedgehog, is of a changeable green, figure 231. A pharaoh's head in dead blue wears a cleft sixty-five, with dark blue stripes. Fine as these pieces are, the chef d'oeuvre of the series is a statuette of one Tom's, first prophet of Amen, now in the Giza Museum. The hieroglyphic inscriptions as well as the details of the mummy bandages are chased in a leaf upon a white ground of admirable smoothness afterwards filled in with enamel. The face and hands are of turquoise blue, the head dresses, Yellow, with violet stripes, the hieroglyphic characters of the inscription, and the vulture with outspread wings upon the breast of the figure, are also violet. The whole is delicate, brilliant, and harmonious, not a flaw mars the purity of the contours or the clearness of the lines. Glazed pottery was common from the earliest times. Cups with a foot, figure 232. Blue bowls, rounded at the bottom and decorated in black ink with mystic eyes. Lotus flowers, fishes, figure 233, and palm leaves, date, as a rule, from the 18th, 19th, or 20th dynasties. Lenticular and P.E. coated, with a greenish glaze, flanked by two crouching monkeys for handles, decorated all on the edge with pearl or egg-shaped ornaments, and round the body with elaborate collars, Figure 234, belong almost without exception to the reigns of a Prius and Amasis. 66, Sistrum handles, saucers, drinking cups in the form of a half-blown lotus, plates, dishes in short, all vessels in common use were required to be not only easy to keep clean, but pleasant to look upon. Did they carry their taste for enameled ware so far as to cover the walls of their houses? With glazed tiles, upon this point we can pronounce neither affirmatively nor negatively, the few examples of this kind of decoration which we possess being all from royal buildings. Upon a yellow brick, we have the family name and ka name of Pepei, upon a green brick, the name of Ramesses III, upon certain red and white fragments, the 
Names of Seti I and Sheshonk. Up to the beginning of the present century, one of the chambers in the steppe. Pyramid at Sakri yet retained its mural decoration of glaze ware. Figure 235. For three-fourths of the wall surface it was covered with green tiles, oblong in shape, flat at the back, and slightly convex on the face. Figure 236. A square. Tenon, pierced through with a hole large enough to receive a wooden rod, served. To fix them together in horizontal pyramid of rows. 67. The three rows which. Frame in the doorway are inscribed with the titles of an unclassed pharaoh. Belonging to one of the first Memphis dynasties. The hieroglyphs are relieved in blue, red, green, and yellow, upon a tawny. Ground. Twenty centuries later, Ramesses III. Originated a new style at Tel El. Yahoo Day. This time the question of ornamentation concerned, not a single. Chamber, but a whole temple. The mass of the building was of limestone and alabaster, but the pictorial subjects, instead of being sculptured according to custom, were of a kind of mosaic made with almost equal parts of stone tessery and glaze ware. The most frequent item in the scheme of decoration was a round or molded of a sandy frick coated with blue or gray slip, upon which is a cream-colored rosette. Figure 237. Some of these rosettes are framed in geometrical designs. Figure 238, or spiderweb patterns, some represent open flowers. The central boss is in relief. The petals and tracery are encrusted in the mass. These roundels, which are of various diameters ranging from 3 eighths of an inch to 4 inches, were fixed to the walls by means of a very fine cement. They were used to form many different designs, as scrolls, foliage, and parallel fillets such as may be seen on the foot of an altar in the base of a column. Preserved in the Giza Museum, the royal ovals were mostly in one piece, so. Also were the figures. The details, either in size or modeled upon the clay. Before firing, were afterwards painted with such colors as might be suitable. The lotus flowers and leaves which were carried along the bottom of the walls. Or the length of the cornices, were, on the contrary, made up of independent. Pieces, each color being a separate morsel cut to fit exactly into the pieces by which it was surrounded. Figure 239. This temple was rifled at the beginning of the present century, and some figures of prisoners brought thence have been in the Louvre collection ever since the time of Champollion. All that remained of the building and its decoration was demolished a few years ago by certain Dealers in antiquities and the debris are now dispersed in all directions. Mariette, though with great difficulty, recovered some of the more important fragments, such as the name of Ramesses III, which dates the building, some borderings of lotus flowers and birds with human hands, figure 240, and some heads of Asiatics and Negro prisoners, figure 241. The destruction of this monument is the more grievous because the Egyptians cannot have constructed many after the same type. Glazed bricks, painted tiles, and enameled mosaics are readily injured, and in the judgment of a people. Enamored of stability and eternity, that would be the gravest of radical defects. 2. Wood, ivory, leather, and textile fabrics. Objects in ivory, bone, and horn are among the rarities of our museums, but we must not for this reason conclude that the Egyptians did not make ample use of those substances. Horn is perishable, and is eagerly devoured by certain insects, which rapidly destroy it. Bone and ivory soon deteriorate and become friable. The elephant was known to the Egyptians from the remotest period. They may, perhaps, have found it inhabiting the Thebaid when first they established themselves in that part of the Nile Valley, for as early as the 5th dynasty we find a pictured form of the elephant in use as the hieroglyphic name of the island of Elephantine. Ivory and tusks and half tusks was imported into Egypt from the regions of the Upper Nile. It was sometimes dyed green or red, but was more generally left of its natural color. It was largely employed by cabinet makers for inlaying furniture, as chairs, bedsteads, and coffers, combs, Dice, hairpins, toilet, ornaments, delicately wrought spoons, 
Figure 242. Coal bottles hollowed out of A. Miniature columns surmounted by a capital, and sense burners in the shape of A. Hand supporting a bronze cup in which the perfumes were burned, and boomerangs engraved with figures of gods and fantastic animals, were also made of ivory. Some of these objects are works of fine art, as for instance at Giza, a poignard handle in the form of a lion, the plaques and bar leaf which adorn the draft box of one Twai, who lived towards the end of the 17th dynasty, a 5th dynasty figure, unfortunately mutilated, which yet retains traces of rose color, and a miniature statue of Abby, who died at the time of the 13th dynasty. This little personage, perched on the top of a lotus flower column, looks straight before him with a majestic air which contrasts somewhat comically with the size and prominence of his ears. The modeling of the figure is broad and spirited, and will bear comparison with good Italian. Ivories of the Renaissance period. Egypt produces few trees, and of these few the greater number are useless to the sculptor. The two which most abound namely, the date palm and the dome. Palmari have two cores of fiber for carving, and are two unequal in texture. Some varieties of the sycamore and acacia are the only trees of which the grain is sufficiently fine and manageable to be wrought with the chisel. Wood was, nevertheless, a favorite material for cheap and rapid work. It was even employed at times for subjects of importance, such as cost statues, and the wooden man of Giza shows with what boldness and amplitude of style it could be treated. But the blocks and beams which the Egyptians had at command were seldom large enough for a statue. The wooden man himself, though but half life size, consists of a number of pieces held together by square pegs. Hence, what carvers were wont to treat their subjects upon such a scale as admitted of their being cut in one block, and the statues of olden time became statuettes under the Theban dynasties. Art lost nothing by the reduction, and more than one of these little figures is comparable to the finest works of the ancient empire. The best, perhaps, is at the Torin Museum, and dates from the 20th dynasty. It represents a young girl whose only garment is a slender girdle. She is of that indefinite age when the undeveloped form is almost as much like that of a boy as of a girl. The expression of the head is gentle, yet saucy. It is, in fact, across thirty centuries of time, a portrait of one of those graceful little maidens of Elephantine, who, without a modesty or embarrassment, walk unclothed in sight of strangers. Three little wooden men in the Giza Museum are probably contemporaries of the torn figure. They wear full dress, as, indeed, they should, for one was a king's favorite name Pori, and surname Bra. They are walking with calm and measured tread, the bust thrown forward, and the head high. The expression upon their faces is knowing, and somewhat sly. An officer who has retired on half pay at the Louvre, figure 243, wears an undress uniform of the time of Amenhotep III, that is to say, a small wig, a close-fitting vest with short sleeves, and a kilt drawn tightly over the hips, reaching scarcely halfway down the thigh, and trimmed in front with a piece of puffing plated longwise. His companion is a priest, figure 244, who wears his hair in rows of little curls one above the other, and is clad in a long petticoat falling below the calf of the leg, and spreading out in front in a kind of plated apron. He holds a sacred standard, consisting of a stout staff surmounted by a ram's head crowned with the solar disc. Both officer and priest are painted red-brown, with the exception of the hair, which is black, the cornea of the eyes, which is white, and the standard, which is yellow. Curiously enough, the little lady Nai, who inhabits the same glass case, is also painted reddish-brown, instead of buff, which was the canonical color for women, figure 245. She is taken in a close-fitting garment trimmed down the front with a band of white embroidery. Round her neck she wears a necklace consisting of a triple row of gold pendants, two golden bracelets, 
adorn her wrists, and on her head she carries a wig with long curls. The right arm hangs by her side, the hand holding some object now lost, which was probably a mirror. The left arm is raised, and with the left hand she presses a lotus lily to her breast. The body is easy and well formed, the figure indicates. Youth, the face is open, smiling, pleasant, and somewhat plebeian. To modify, the unwieldy mass of the headdress was beyond the skill of the artist, but the bus is delicately and elegantly modeled, the clinging garment gives discreet emphasis to the shape, and the action of the hand which holds the flower is rendered with grace and naturalness. All these are portraits, and as the sitters were not persons of august rank, we may conclude that they did not employ the most fashionable artists. They, doubtless, had recourse to more unpretending craftsmen, but that such craftsmen were thus highly trained in knowledge of form and accuracy of execution, shows how strongly even the artisan was influenced by the great school of sculpture which then flourished at Thebes. This influence becomes even more apparent when we study the knick-knacks of the toilet table, and such small objects as, properly speaking, come under the head of furniture. To pass and review the hundred and one little articles of female ornament a luxury to which the fancy of the designer gave all kinds of ingenious and novel forms, would be no light task. The handles of mirrors, for instance, generally represented a stem of lotus or papyrus surmounted by a full-blown flower, from the midst of which rose a disc of polished metal. For this, designer sometimes substituted the figure of a young girl, either nude or clad in a close-fitting garment, who holds the mirror on her head. The tops of hairpins were carved in the semblance of a coiled serpent, or of the head of a jackal, a dog, or a hawk. The pin cushion in which they are placed is a hedgehog or a tortoise, with holes pierced in a formal pattern upon the back. The headdress, which served for pillows, were decorated with bar reliefs of subjects derived. From the midst of Bess and Seket, the grimacing features of the former deity, being carved on the ends or on the base. But it is in the carving of perfume spoons and cold bottles that the inventive skill of the craftsmen is most brilliantly displayed. Not to soil their fingers, the Egyptians made use of spoons for essences, pomades, and the variously colored preparations with which both men and women stain their cheeks, lips, eyelids, nails, and palms. The designer generally borrowed his subjects from the fauna or flora of the Nile. Valley. A little case at Giza is carved in the shape of a couch and calf, the body being hollowed out, and the head and back forming a removable lid. A spoon in the same collection represents a dog running away with an enormous fish in his mouth. Figure 246. The body of the fish forming the bowl of the spoon. Another shows a cartouche springing from a full-blown lotus. Another, a lotus fruit laid upon a bouquet of flowers. Figure 247, and here is a simple triangular bowl, the handle decorated with a stem and two buds, figure 248. The most elaborate specimens combine these subjects with the human figure. A young girl, clad in a mere girdle, is represented in the act of swimming. Figure 249. Her head is well lifted above the water, and her outstretched arms support a duck the body of which is hollowed out, while the wings, being movable, serve as a cover. We have also a young girl in the Louvre collection, but she stands in a maze of lotus plants, figure 250, and is in the act of gathering a bud. A bunch of stems, from which emerge two full-blown blossoms, unites the handle to the bowl of the spoon, which is in reverse position, the larger end, being turned outwards and the point inwards. Elsewhere, a young girl, figure 251, playing upon a long neck lute as she trips. A long, is framed in by two flowering stems. Sometimes the fair musician is standing upright in a tiny skiff, figure 252, and sometimes a girl bearing offerings is substituted for the lute player. Another example represents a slave toiling under the weight of an enormous sack. The age and physiognomy of each of these personages is clearly indicated. The lotus gatherer is of good birth, 
as may be seen by her carefully plaited hair. In tunic, the Theban ladies wore long robes, but this damsel has gathered up her skirts that she may thread her way among the reeds without wetting her. Garments. The two musicians and the swimming girl belong, on the contrary, to an inferior, or servile, class. Two of them wore only a girdle, and the third is a short garment negligently fastened. The bearer of offerings, figure 253, wears the long pennant tresses distinctive of childhood, and is one of those slender, growing girls of the Fellaheen class whom one sees in such numbers on the banks of the Nile. Her lack of clothing is, however, no evidence of one of birth, for not even the children of nobility were one to put on the garments of their sex before the period of adolescence. Lastly, the slave, figure 254, with his thick lips, his high shoulders, his flat nose, his heavy, animal jaw, his low brow, and his bare, conical head, is evidently a caricature of some foreign prisoner. The dog sullenness with which he trudges under his burden is admirably caught, while the angularities of the body, the type of the head, and the general arrangement of the parts, remind one of the terracotta grotesques of Asia Minor. In these subjects, all the minor details, the fruits, the flowers, the various kinds of birds, are rendered with much truth and cleverness. Of the three ducks which are tied by the feet and slung over the arms. Of the girl bearing offerings, two are resigned to their fate, and hang swinging. With open eyes and outstretched necks, but the third flaps her wings and lifts her head protestingly. The two small waterfowl perched upon the lotus flowers. Listen placidly to the lute player's music, their beaks resting on their crops. They have learned by experience not to put themselves out of the way for a song and they know that there is nothing to fear from a young girl, unless she is armed. They are put to flight in the bar leaves by the mere sight of a bow and arrows, just as a company of rooks is put to flight nowadays by the sight of a gun. The Egyptians were especially familiar with the ways of animals and birds, and reproduced them with marvelous exactness. The habit of minutely observing minor facts became instinctive, and it informed their most trifling works with that air of reality which strikes us so forcibly at the present day. Household furniture was no more abundant in ancient Egypt than it is in the Egypt of today. In the time of the twelfth dynasty an ordinary house contained no bedsteads, but low frameworks like the Nubian Angareb, or mats rolled up, by day on which the owners lay down at night in their clothes, pillowing their heads on earthenware, stone, or wooden headdress. There were also two or three simple stone seats, some wooden chairs or stools, with carved legs, chests and boxes of various sizes for clothes and tools, and a few common vessels of pottery or bronze. For making fire there were fire sticks, and the bow drill for using them, figures 255 and 181, children's toys were even then found in great variety though of somewhat quaint construction. There were dolls with wigs and movable limbs, made in stone pottery, and wood, figure 256, figures of men, and animals, and terracotta boats, balls of wooden stuffed leather, whip tops, and tip cats, figure 257. The art of the cabinet maker was nevertheless carried to a high degree of perfection, from the time of the ancient dynasties. Planks were dressed down with the ads, mortised, glued, joined together by means of pegs cut in hard wood, or acacia thorns, never by metal nails, polished, and finely covered with paintings. Chests generally stand upon four straight legs, and are occasionally thus raised to some height from the ground. The lid is flat, or rounded according to a special curvature, figure 258, much in favor among the Egyptians of all periods. Sometimes, though rarely, it is gable-shaped, like our house roofs, figure 259. Generally speaking, the lid lifts off bodily, but it often turns upon a peg inserted in one of the uprights. Sometimes, also, it turns upon wooden pivots, figure 260. The panels, which are large and admirably suited for decorative art, are enriched with paintings, 
or inlaid with ivory, silver, precious woods, or enameled. Plax. It may be that we are scarcely in a position justly to appraise the skill of Egyptian cabinet makers, or the variety of designs produced at various periods. Nearly all the furniture which has come down to our day has been found in tombs, and, being destined for burial in the sepulchre, may either be of a character exclusively destined for the use of the mummy, or possibly a cheap imitation of a more precious class of goods. The mummy was, in fact, the cabinet maker's best customer. In other lands, man took but a few objects with him into the next world, but the defunct Egyptian required nothing short of a complete outfit. The mummy case alone was an actual monument, in the construction of which a whole squad of workmen was employed. Figure 261. The styles of mummy cases varied from period to period. Under the men feet. In first Theban empires, we find only rectangular chests and sycamore wood, flat at top and bottom, and made of many pieces joined together by wooden pins. The pattern is not elegant, but the decoration is very curious. The lid has no cornice. Outside, it is inscribed down the middle with a long column of hieroglyphs, sometimes merely written in ink, sometimes laid on in color. Sometimes carved and hollowed out signs filled in with some kind of bluish paste. The inscription records only the name and titles of the deceased, accompanied now and then by a short form of prayer in his favor. The inside is covered with a thick coat of stucco or whitewash. Upon this surface, the seventeenth chapter of the Book of the Dead was generally written in red and black inks, and in fine cursive hieroglyphs. The the body of the chest is made with three horizontal planks for the bottom, and eight vertical planks, placed two and two, for the four sides. The outside is sometimes decorated with long strips of various colors ending in interlaced lotus leaves, such as are seen on stone sarcophagi. More frequently, it is ornamented on the left side with two wide open eyes and two monumental doors, and on the right with three doors exactly like those seen in contemporary catacombs. The sarcophagus is in truth the house of the deceased, and, being his house, its four walls were bound to contain an epitome of the prayers and tableaus which covered the walls of his tomb. The necessary formulae and pictured scenes were, therefore, reproduced inside, nearly in the same order in which they appear in the mastabas. Each side is divided in three registers, each register containing a dedication in the name of the deceased, or representations of objects belonging to him, or such texts from the ritual as need to be repeated for his benefit, skillfully composed and painted upon a background made to imitate some precious wood, the whole forms a boldly designed and harmoniously colored picture. The cabinet maker's share of the work was the lightest, in the long boxes in which the dead of the earliest period were buried, made no great demand upon his skill. This, however, was not the case when in later times the sarcophagus came to be fashioned in the likeness of the human body. Of this style we have two leading types, and the most ancient, the mummy, serves as the model for his case. His outstretched feet and legs are in one. The form of the knee the swell of the calf, the contours of the thigh and the trunk, are summarily indicated, and are, as it were, vaguely modeled under the wood. The head, apparently the only living part of this inert body, is wrought out in the round. The dead man is in this wise imprisoned in a kind of statue of himself. And this statue is so well balanced that it can stand on its feet if required, as upon a pedestal. In the other type of sarcophagus, the deceased lies at full length. Upon his tomb, and his figure, sculptured in the round, serves as the lid of his mummy case. On his head is seen the ponderous wig of the period, a white linen vest and a long petticoat cover his chest and legs. His feet are shod with elegant sandals. His arms lie straight along his sides, or are folded upon his breast, the hands grasping various emblems, as the ankh, the girdle buckle, the tat. 69, or, 
as in the case of the wife of Senate Muegiza, a garland of ivy. This mummiform type of sarcophagus is rarely met with under the Memphi. Dynasties, though that of Menkera, the Miserinus of the Greeks, affords a memorable example. Under the 11th dynasty, the mummy cases frequently but a hollow tree trunk, roughly sculptured outside, with a head at one end and feet at the other. The face is dowed with bright colors, yellow, red, and green, the wig and headdress are striped with black and blue, and an elaborate collar is depicted on the breast. The rest of the case is either covered with the long, gilded wings of Isis and Nephthys, or with a uniform tint of white, or yellow, and sparsely decorated with symbolic figures, or columns of hieroglyphs painted blue and black. Among the sarcophagi belonging to kings of the 17th dynasty which I recovered from Deir el-Bahari, the most highly finished belong to this type, and were only remarkable for the really extraordinary skill with which the craftsmen had reproduced the features of the deceased sovereigns. The mask of Amis I, that of Amenhotep I, and that of Thothans II, are masterpieces in their way. The mask of Ramesses II shows no sign of paint, except a black line, which accentuates the form of the eye. The face is doubtless modeled in the likeness of the pharaoh Herror, who restored the funerary outfit of his puissant ancestor, and it will almost bear comparison with the best works of contemporary sculpture, figure 262. 2. Mummy cases found in the same place namely, those of Queen Ames Nefertari and her daughter, Ahotep II are of gigantic size, and measure more than ten and a half feet in height, figure 263. Standing upright, they might almost be taken. For two of the caryatid statues from the first court at Medinet Habu, though on a smaller scale, the bodies are represented as bandaged, and but vaguely indicate the contours of the human form. The shoulders and busts of each are covered with a kind of network and relief every mesh standing out in blue upon a yellow ground. The hands emerge from this mantle, are crossed upon the breast, and grasp the ankh, or tau cross, symbolic of eternal life. The heads are portraits. The faces are round, the eyes large, the expression mild and characterless. Each is crowned with the flat top cap and lofty plumes of amen or mount. We cannot but wonder for what reason these huge receptacles were made. The two queens were small of stature, and their mummies which were well nigh lost in. The cases had to be packed round with an immense quantity of rags, to prevent them from shifting, and becoming injured. Apart from their abnormal size, these cases are characterized by the same simplicity which distinguishes other mummy cases of royal or private persons of the same period. Towards the middle of the 19th dynasty, the fashion changed. The single mummy case, soberly decorated, was superseded by two, three, and even four cases, fitting the one into the other, and covered with paintings and inscriptions. Sometimes the outer receptacle is a sarcophagus with convex lid and square ears, upon which the deceased is pictured over and over again upon a white ground, in adoration before the gods of the Osirian cycle. When, however, it is shaped in human form, it retains somewhat of the old simplicity. The face is painted, a color is represented on the chest, a band of hieroglyphs extends down the whole length of the body to the feet, and the rest is in one uniform tone of black, brown, or dark yellow. The inner cases were extravagantly rich, the hands and faces being red, rose-colored, or gilded, the jewelry painted, or sometimes imitated by means of small morsels of enamel encrusted in the woodwork, the surfaces frequently covered with many colored scenes and legends, and the whole heightened by means of the yellow varnish already mentioned. The lavish ornamentation of this period is in striking contrast with the sobriety of earlier times, but in order to grasp the reason of this change, one must go to Thebes and visit the actual sepulchres of the dead the kings and private persons of the great conquering dynasty 70, devoted their energies, and all the means at their disposal, to the excavation of catacombs. The walls of 
Those catacombs were covered with sculptures and paintings. The sarcophagus was cut in one enormous block of granite or alabaster, and admirably wrought. It was therefore of little moment if the wooden coffin in which the mummy repose were very simply decorated. But the Egyptians of the decadence, and their rulers, had not the wealth of Egypt and the spoils of neighboring countries at command. They were poor, and the slenderness of their resources debarred them from great undertakings. They for the most part gave up the preparation of magnificent tombs, and employed such wealth as remained to them in the fabrication of fine mummy cases carved in sycamore wood. The beauty of their coffins, therefore, but affords an additional proof of their weakness and poverty. When for a few centuries the Sayyid princes had succeeded in re-establishing the prosperity of the country, stone sarcophagi came once more into requisition, and the wooden coffin reverted to somewhat of the simplicity of the great period. But this renaissance was not destined to last. The Macedonian conquest brought back the same revolution in funerary fashions which followed the fall of the Remesides, and double and triple. Mummy cases, over-painted and over-gilded, were again in demand. If the craftsmen of Greco-Roman time who attired the dead of Ekamim for their last resting places were less skillful than those of earlier date, their bad taste was, at all events, not surpassed by the Theban coffin makers who lived and worked. Under the latest princes of the royal line of Ramesses, a series of Greco-Roman examples from the Fiam exhibit the stages by which portraiture in the flat there replaced the modeled mask, until towards the middle of the second century AD it became customary to bandage over the face of the mummy a panel portrait of the dead, as he was in life, figure 264. The remainder of the funerary outfit supplied the cabinet maker with as much work as the coffin maker. Boxes of various shapes and sizes were required for the wardrobe of the mummy, for his viscera, and for his funerary statuettes. He must also have tables for his meals, stools, chairs, a bed to lie upon, a boat and sledge to convey him to the tomb, and sometimes even a war chariot and a carriage in which to take the air. 71. The boxes for canopic vases, funerary statuettes, and libation vases, are divided in several compartments. A couch in jackal is sometimes placed on the top, and serves for a handle by which to take off the lid. Each box was provided with its own little sledge, upon which it was drawn in the funeral procession on the day of burial. Beds are not very uncommon. Many are identical in structure with the Nubian Angarebs, and consist merely of some coarse fabric or of interlaced strips of leather, stretched on a plain wooden frame. Few exceed fifty-six inches in length, the sleeper, therefore, could never lie outstretched, but must perforce assume a doubled-up position. The frame is generally horizontal, but sometimes it slopes slightly downwards from the head to the foot. It was often raised to a considerable height above the level of the floor, in a stool, or a little portable set of steps was used in mounting it. These details were known to us by the wall paintings. Only until I myself discovered two perfect specimens in 1884 and 1885, one at Thebes, in a tomb of the 13th dynasty, and the other at Ekamim, in the Greco-Roman necropolis. In the former, two accommodating lions have elongated their bodies to form the framework, their heads doing duty for the head of the bed, and their tails being curled up under the feet of the sleeper. The bed is surmounted by a kind of canopy, under which the mummy lay in state. Ryan had already found a similar canopy, which is now in the museum. Of Edinburgh 72, figure 265. In shape it is a temple, the rounded roof being supported by elegant colonnettes of painted wood. A doorway guarded by serpents is supposed to give access to the miniature edifice three-winged disc, each larger than the one below it, adorned three superimposed cornices above the door, the whole frontage being surmounted by a row of erect uria, crowned with a solar disc. The canopy belonging to the 13th dynasty bed is 
much more simple, being a mere balustrade in cut and painted wood, in imitation of the water plant pattern with which temple walls were decorated, the holes crowned with an ordinary cornice, in the bed of Greco-Roman date, figure 266, carved and painted figures of the goddess Ma, sitting with her feather on her knee, are substituted for the customary balustrades. Isis and Nepis stand with their winged arms outstretched at the head and foot. The roof is open, save for a row of vultures hovering above the mummy, which is wept over by two kneeling statuettes of Isis and Nepis, one at each. And the sledges upon which mummies were dragged to the sepulchre were also furnished with canopies, but in a totally different style. The sledge canopy is a paneled shrine, like those which I discovered in 1886, in the tomb of Senenmu. At Kernet Murray, if light was admitted, it came through a square opening, showing the head of the mummy within. Wilkinson gives an illustration of a sledge canopy of this kind, from the wall. Paintings of a Theban tomb, figure 267. The panels were always made to slide. As soon as the mummy was laid upon his sledge, the panels were closed, the Cornice roof placed over all, and the hole closed in. With regard to chairs, many of those in the Louvre and the British Museum were made about the time of the 11th dynasty. These are not the least beautiful specimens which have come down to us, one in particular, figure 268, having preserved an extraordinary brilliancy of color. The framework, formerly fitted with a seat of strong netting, was originally supported on four legs with lion's feet. The back is ornamented with two lotus flowers, and with a row of lozenges inlaid in ivory. An ebony upon a red ground. Stools of similar workmanship, figure 269, and folding stools, the feet of which are in the form of a goose's head, may be seen. In all museums, pharaohs and persons of high rank affected more elaborate designs. Their seats, were sometimes raised very high, the arms being carved to resemble running lions, and the lower supports being prisoners of war, bound back to back, figure 270. A footboard in front served as a step to mount by, and as a footstool for the sitter. Up to the present time, we have found no specimens of this kind of seat. 73 we learn from the tomb paintings that netted or cane bottom chairs were covered with stuffed seats and richly worked cushions. These cushions and stuffed seats have perished, but it is to be concluded that they were covered with tapestry. Tapestry was undoubtedly known to the Egyptians, in a bar leaf. Subject at Beni Hassan, figure 271-74, shows the process of weaving. The frame, which is of the simplest structure, resembles that now in use among the weavers. Of the Ikemen. It is horizontal, and is formed of two slender cylinders, or rather of two rods, about 54 inches apart, each held in place by two large pegs, driven into the ground about three feet distant from each other. The warps of the chain were strongly fastened, then rolled round the top cylinder till they were stretched sufficiently tight. Mill sticks placed at certain distances facilitated the insertion of the needles which carried the thread. As in the Gablon factory, the work was begun from the bottom. The texture was regulated and equalized by means of a coarse comb, and was rolled upon the lower cylinder as it increased in length. Hangings and carpets were woven in this manner, some with figures, others with geometrical designs, zigzags, and checkers. Figure 272 A careful examination of the monuments has, however, convinced me that most of the subjects hitherto supposed to represent examples of tapestry represent, in fact, examples of cut and painted leather. The leather workers' craft flourished in ancient Egypt. Few museums are without a pair of leather sandals, or a specimen of mummy braces with ends of stamped leather bearing the effigy of a god, a pharaoh, a hieroglyphic legend, a rosette, or perhaps all combined. These little relics are not older than the time of the priest kings, or the earlier. Babastites. It is to the same period that we must attribute the great cut leather. Canopy in the Giza Museum. The catafalque upon which the mummy was laid. 
when transported from the mortuary establishment to the tomb, was frequently adorned with a covering made of stuff or soft leather. Sometimes the side pieces hung down, and sometimes they were drawn aside with bands, like curtains, and showed the coffin. The canopy of Deir el Bahari was made for the Princess Izium Kep, daughter of the High Priest Masahiri, wife of the High Priest Menkapera, and mother of the High Priest Panotum III. The centerpiece, in shape an oblong square, is divided into three bands of sky blue leather, now faded to pearl gray. The two side pieces are sprinkled with yellow stars. Upon the middle piece are rows of vultures, whose outspread wings protect the mummy. Four other pieces covered with red and green. Checkers are attached to the ends and sides. The longer pieces which hung over. The sides are united to the centerpiece by an ornamental bordering. On the right, scarabae with extended wings alternate with the car touches of King Panotum. Two, and are surmounted by a lance head frieze. On the left side, the pattern is more complicated. Figure 273. In the center we see a bunch of lotus lilies flanked by royal car touches. Next come two antelopes, each kneeling upon a basket. Then two bouquets of papyrus, then two more scarabae, similar to those upon the other border. The lancehead frieze finishes it above, as on the opposite side. The technical process is very curious. The hieroglyphs and figures were cut out from large pieces of leather, then, under the open spaces thus left, were sewn. Thongs of leather of whatever color was required for those ornaments or hieroglyphs. Finally, in order to hide the patchwork effect presented at the back, the hole was lined with long strips of white, or light yellow, leather. Despite the difficulties of treatment which this work presented, the result is most remarkable. 75. The outlines of the gazelles, scarabae, and flowers are as clean-cut and as elegant as if drawn with the pen upon a wall surface or a page of papyrus. The choice of subjects is happy, and the colors employed are both lively and harmonious. The craftsmen who designed and executed the canopy of Izzyankep had profited by a long experience of this system of decoration, and of the kind of pattern suitable to the material. For my own part, I have not the slightest doubt that the cushions of chairs and royal couches, and the sails of funeral and sacred boats used for the transport of mummies and divine images, were most frequently made in leatherwork. The checker pattern sail represented in one of the boat subjects painted on the wall of a chamber in the tomb of Ramesses III, figure 274, might be mistaken for one of the side pieces of the canopy at Giza, the vultures and fantastic birds, depicted upon the sails of another boat, figure 275, are neither more strange nor more difficult to make in cut leather than the vultures and gazelles of Izium Kep. We have it upon the authority of ancient writers that the Egyptians of olden time, embroidered as skillfully as those of the Middle Ages, the surcoats given by Amasis, one to the Lacedaemonians, and the other to the temple of Athena. Lindas were of linen embroidered with figures of animals in gold thread and purple, each thread consisting of 365 distinct filaments. To go back to a still earlier period, the monumental tableaus show portraits of the pharaohs wearing garments with borders, either woven or embroidered, or done in applique work. The most simple patterns consist of one or more stripes of brilliant color parallel with the edge of the material. Elsewhere we see palm patterns, or rows of discs and points, leaf patterns, meanders, and even, here and there, figures of men, gods, or animals, worked most probably with the needle. None of the textile materials yet found upon royal mummies are thus decorated. We are therefore unable to pronounce upon the quality of this work, or the method employed in its production. Once only, upon the body of one of the dear Al-Bahari princesses, did I find a royal cartouche embroidered in pale rose color. The Egyptians of the best period seem to have attached special value to plain stuffs, and especially to white ones. These they wove with marvelous skill, and upon looms in every respect identical with those used in tapestry work. 
those portions of the winding sheet of Fawfus three, which enfolded the royal hands and arms, are as fine as the finest India muslin, and as fairly merit. The name of woven air is the gauzes of the island of Kos. This, of course, is a mere question of manufacture, apart from the domain of art, embroideries and tapestries were not commonly used in Egypt till about the end of the Persian period, or the beginning of the period of Greek rule. Alexandria became partly peopled by Phoenician, Syrian, and Jewish colonists, who brought with them the methods of manufacture peculiar to their own countries, and founded workshops which soon developed into flourishing establishments. It is to the Alexandrians that Pliny ascribes the invention of weaving with several warps, thus producing the stuff called brocades, polymeda, and in the time of the first Caesars, it was a recognized fact that the needle of Babylon was henceforth surpassed by the comb of the Nile. The Alexandrian tapestries were not made after exclusively geometrical designs, like the products of the old Egyptian looms, but, according to the testimony of the ancients, were enriched with figures of animals, and even of men, of the masterpieces which adorn the palaces of the Ptolemies no specimens remain. Many fragments which may be attributed to the later Roman time have, however, been found in Egypt, such as the piece with the boy and goose described by Wilkinson, and a piece representing marine divinities bought by myself at Coptus. 76. The numerous embroidered winding sheets with woven borders which have recently been discovered near Ekamim and in the Fayum are nearly all from Coptic tombs and are more nearly akin to Byzantine art than to the art of Egypt. 3. Metals. The Egyptians classified metals under two heads namely, the noble metals, as gold, electrum, and silver, and the base metals, as copper, iron, lead, and, at a later period, tin. The two lists are divided by the mention of certain kinds of precious stones, such as lapis lazuli and malachite. Iron was reserved for weapons of war, and tools, and used for hard substances, such as sculptures and masons' chisels, axe and adze heads, knife blades, and saws. Lead was comparatively useless, but was sometimes used for inlaying temple doors, coffers, and furniture. Also small statuettes of gods were occasionally made in this metal, especially those of Osiris and Anubis. Copper was too yielding to be available for objects in current use. Bronze, therefore, was the favorite metal of the Egyptians. Though often affirmed, it is not true that they succeeded in tempering bronze so that it became as hard as iron ore. Steel, but by varying the constituents in their relative proportions, they were able to give it a variety of very different qualities. Most of the objects hitherto analyzed have yielded precisely the same quantities of copper and tin commonly used by the bronze founders of the present day. Those analyzed by Vokalanen, 1825 contained 84% of copper 14%, of tin, and 1%, of iron, and other substances. A chisel brought from Egypt by Sir Gardner Wilkinson contained only from 5 to 9% of tin, 1%, of iron, and 94 of copper. Certain fragments of statuettes and mirrors more recently subjected to analysis have yielded a notable quantity of gold and silver, thus corresponding with the Bronzes of Corinth. Other specimens resemble brass, both in their color and substance. Many of the best Egyptian bronzes offer a surprising resistance to damp and oxidize with difficulty. While yet hot from the mold, they were rubbed with some kind of resinous varnish which filled up the pores and deposited an unalterable patina upon the surface. Each kind of bronze had its special use. The ordinary bronze was employed for weapons in common. Amulets, the brazen alloy served for household utensils, the bronzes mixed. With gold and silver were destined only for mirrors, costly weapons, and statuettes of value. In none of the tomb paintings which I have seen is there any representation of bronze founding or bronze working, but this omission is 
easily supplemented by the objects themselves. Tools, arms, rings, and cheap. Vases were sometimes forged, and sometimes cast whole in molds of hard clay. Or stone. Works of art were cast in one or several pieces according to. Circumstances, the parts were then united, soldered, and retouched with the. Buren. The method most frequently employed was to prepare a core of mixed clay and charcoal, or sand, which roughly reproduced the modeling of the mold into which it was introduced. The layer of metal between this core and the mold was often so thin that it would have yielded to any moderate pressure, had they not taken the precaution to consolidate it by having the core. For a support that domestic utensils and small household instruments were mostly made in bronze. Such objects are exhibited by thousands in our museums, and frequently figure in bas-reliefs and mural paintings. Art and trade were not incompatible in Egypt, and even the coppersmith sought to give elegance of form, and to add ornaments in a good style, to the humblest of his works. The saucepan in which the cook of Ramesses III concocted his masterpieces is supported on lion's feet. Here's a hot water jug which looks as if it were precisely like its modern successors, figure 276, but on a closer examination we shall find that the handle is a full-blown lotus, the petals, which are bent over at an angle to the stalk, resting against the edge of the neck, figure 277. The handles of knives and spoons are almost always in the form of a duck's or goose's neck, slightly curved. The bowl is sometimes fashioned like an animal. As, for instance, a gazelle ready bound for the sacrifice, figure 278. On the hilt of a sable we find a little crouching jackal, and the larger limb of a pair of scissors. And the Giza Museum is made in the likeness of an Asiatic captive, his arms tied. Behind his back, a lotus leaf forms the disc of a mirror, and its stem is the handle. One perfume box is a fish, another is a bird, another is a grotesque deity. Illustration vases, or sigilli, carried by priests and priestesses for the purpose of sprinkling either the faithful, or the ground traversed by religious processions, merit the special consideration of connoisseurs. They are ovoid or pointed at the bottom, and decorated with subjects either. Chase or in relief. These sometimes represent deities, each in a separate frame and sometimes scenes of worship. The work is generally very minute. Bronze came into use for statuary purposes from a very early period, but time, unfortunately, has preserved none of those idols which peopled the temples of the ancient empire. Whatsoever may be said to the contrary, we possess no bronze statuettes of any period anterior to the expulsion of the Hyksos. Some Theban figures date quite certainly from the 18th and 19th dynasties. The chaste lines had found with the jewels of Queen Ahotep, the Harpocrates of Giza inscribed with the names of Kames and Amis I, and several statuettes of Amen, said to have been discovered at Medinet Habu and Sheikh Abd el Gurney, are of that period. Our most important bronzes belong, however, to the 22nd dynasty, or, later still, to the time of the Sayyid. Pharaohs. Many are not older than the first Ptolemies. A fragment found in the ruins of Tanis and now in the possession of Count Stroganov, formed part of a votive statue dedicated by King Pisacanu. It was originally two-thirds the size of life, and is the largest specimen known. A portrait statuette of the Lady to cush it, given to the Museum of Athens by M. Demetrio, the four statuettes from the Posna collection now at the Louvre, and the kneeling genius of Giza, are all from the site of Bubastis, and date probably from the years which immediately preceded the accession of Semeticus I. The lady to cush it is standing, the left foot advanced, the right arm hanging down, the left raised and brought close to the body, figure 279. She wears a short robe embroidered with religious subjects, and has bracelets on her arms and wrists. Upon her head she has a wig with flat curls, row above row. The details. Both of her robe and jewels are engraved in incised lines upon the surface of the bronze and inlaid with silver threads. The face is evidently a portrait, and 
represents a woman of mature age. The form, according to the traditions of Egyptian art, is that of a younger woman, slender, firm, and supple. The copper in this bronze is largely intermixed with gold, thus producing a chastened luster which is admirably suited to the richness of the embroidered garment. The kneeling genius of Giza is as rude and repellent as the Lady de Cushet is delicate and harmonious. He has a hawk's head, and he worships the sun, as is the duty of the Heliopolitan genii. His right arm is uplifted, his left is pressed to his breast. The style of the whole is dry, and the granulated surface of the skin adds to the heart effect of the figure. The action, however, is energetic and correct, and the bird's head is adjusted with surprising skill to the man's neck and shoulders. The same qualities and the same faults distinguish the horse of the Postno collection. Figure 280. Standing, he uplifted a libation vase, now lost, and poured the contents upon a king who once stood face to face with him. This roughness of treatment is less apparent in the other three Postno figures, above all in that which bears the name of Masu engraved over the place of the heart, figure 281. Like the Horus, this Masu stands upright, his left foot advanced, and his left arm pendant. His right hand is raised, as grasping the wand of office. The trunk is naked, and round his loins he wears a striped cloth with a squared and falling. In front, his head is clad in a short wig covered with short curls piled one above. The other, the ear is round and large. The eyes are well open, and were originally of silver, but have been stolen by some Arab. The features have a remarkable expression of pride and dignity. After these, what can be said for the thousands of statuettes of Osiris, of Isis, of Nephthys, of Horus, of Nefertum, which have been found in the sands and ruins of Sacra, Bubastis, and other cities of the Delta? Many are, without doubt, charming objects for glass cases, and are to be admired for perfection of casting and delicacy of execution, but the greater number are mere articles of commerce, made upon the same pattern, and perhaps in the self-same molds, century after century, for the delight of devotees and pilgrims. They are rounded, vulgar, destitute of originality, and have no more distinction than the thousands of colored statuettes of saints and virgins which stock the shelves of our modern dealers and pious wares. An exception must, however, be made in favor of the images of animals, such as rams, sphinxes, and lions, which to the last retain a more pronounced stamp of individuality. The Egyptians had a special predilection for the feline race. They have represented the lion in every attitude giving chase to the antelope. Springing upon the hunter, wounded, and turning to bite his wound, catchant. And disdainfully calm and no people have depicted him with a more thorough knowledge of his habits, or with so intense a vitality. Several gods and goddesses, Ashu, Anhor, Bast, Seket, Tefnut, have the form of the lion or of the cat and inasmuch as the worship of these deities was more popular in the Delta than elsewhere, so there never passes a year when from amid the ruins of Bubastis, Tanis, Mendes, or some less famous city, there is not dug up a store of little figures of lions and lionesses, or of men and women with lions' heads, or cats' heads. The cats of Bubastis and the lions of Tel S. Saba crowd our museums. The lines of Horbi it may be reckoned among the chefs Durgov. Egyptian statuary. Upon one of the largest among them is inscribed the name of Aprius, figure 282, but if even this evidence were lacking, the style of the piece would compel us to attribute it to the Sayat period. It formed part of the ornamentation of a temple or Nalus door, and the other side was either built into a wall or embedded in a piece of wood. The lion is caught in a trap, or, perhaps, lying down in an oblong cage, with only his head and four feet outside. The lines of the body are simple and full of power, the expression of the face is calm and strong. In breadth and majesty he almost equals the fine limestone lines of Amenhotep III. 
The idea of inlaying gold and other precious metals upon the surface of bronze. Stone, or wood was already ancient in Egypt in the time of Khufu. The gold is often amalgamated with pure silver. When amalgamated to the extent of 20 per cent, it changes its name, and is called electrum, asimu. This electrum is of a fine light yellow color. It pales as the proportion of silver becomes larger, and at 60 percent, it is nearly white. The silver came chiefly from Asia, in rings, sheets, and bricks of standard weight. The gold and the electrum came partly from Syria and bricks and rings, and partly from the Sudan and nuggets and gold dust. The processes of refining and alloying are figured on certain monuments of the early dynasties. In a bar leaf at Sakura, we see the weight gold entrusted to the craftsmen for working. In another example, at Beni Hassan, the washing hand melting down of the ore is represented, and again at Debs, the goldsmith is depicted seated in front of his crucible, holding the blowpipe to his lips with the left hand, and grasping his pincers with the right, thus fanning the flame and at the same time making ready to seize the ingot. Figure 283. The Egyptians struck neither coins nor metals. With these exceptions, they made the same use of the precious metals as we do ourselves. We gild the crosses and cupolas of our churches, they covered the doors of their temples, the lower part of their wall surfaces, certain bar reliefs, pyramidians of obelisks, and even whole obelisks, with plates of gold. The obelisks of Queen Hatshepsut at Karnak were coated with electrum. They were visible from both banks of the Nile, and when the sun rose between them as he came up from the heavenly horizon, they flooded the two Egypts with their dazzling rays. 77. These plates of metal were forged with hammer and anvil. For smaller objects, they made use of little pellets beaten flat between two pieces of parchment. In the Museum of the Louvre we have a gilder's book, and the gold leaf which it contains is as thin as the gold leaf used by the German goldsmiths of the past century. Gold was applied to bronze surfaces by means of an ammoniacal solvent. If the object to be gilt were a wooden statuette, the Workmen began by sticking a piece of fine linen all over the surface, or by covering it with a very thin coat of plaster, upon this he laid his gold or silver leaf. It was thus that wooden statuettes of Thoth, Horus, and Nefertim were gilded, from the time of Khufu. The Temple of Isis, the Lady of the Pyramid, contained a dozen such images, and this temple was not one of the largest in the Memphite necropolis. There would seem to have been hundreds of gilded statues in the Theban temples, at all events in the time of the victorious dynasties of the New Empire, and as regards wealth, the Ptolemaic sanctuaries were no wise inferior to those of the Theban period. Bronze and gilded wood were not always good enough for the gods of Egypt. They exacted pure gold, and their worshippers gave them as much of it as possible. Entire statues of the precious metals were dedicated by the kings of Theanchan and Middle Empires, and the pharaohs of the 18th and 19th dynasties, who drew at will upon the treasures of Asia, transcended all that had been done by their predecessors. Even in times of decadence, the feudal lords kept up the traditions of the past, and, like Prince Menchuan had, replaced the images of gold and silver which had been carried off from Karnak by the Generals of Sardanapalus at the time of the Assyrian invasions. The quantity of metal thus consecrated to the service of the gods must have been considerable. If many figures were less than an inch in height, many others measured three cubits or more. Some were of gold, some of silver, others were part gold and part silver. There were even some which combined gold with sculptured ivory, ebony, and precious stones, thus closely resembling the Chryselephantine statues of the Greeks, aided by the bar-relief subjects of Karnak, Medinet Habu, and Dendera, as well as by the statues in wood and limestone which have come down to our day, we can tell exactly what they were like. However the material might vary, the style was always the same. Nothing is more perishable than works of this description. 
they are foredoomed to destruction by the mere value of the materials in which they are made. What civil war and foreign invasion had spared, and what had chance to escape the rapacity of Roman princes and governors, fell a prey to Christian iconoclasm. A few tiny statuettes buried as amulets upon the bodies of mummies, a few domestic divinities buried in the ruins of private houses, a few ex votos forgotten, perchance, in some dark corner of a fallen sanctuary, have escaped till the present day. The Pata and Amen of Queen Ahotep, another golden Amen also at Giza, and the silver. Vulture found in 1885 at Medinet Habu, are the only pieces of this kind which can be attributed with certainty to the great period of Egyptian art. The remainder are of Sayyid or Ptolemaic work, and are remarkable only for the perfection with which they are wrought. The gold and silver vessels used in the service of the temples, and in the houses of private persons, shared the fate of the statues. At the beginning of the present century, the Louvre acquired some flat-bottomed cups which Thothens III presented as the reward of valor to one of his generals named Tehuti. The silver cup is much mutilated, but the golden cup is intact and elegantly designed. Figure 284. The upright sides are adorned with a hieroglyphic legend. A central rosette is engraved at the bottom. Six fish are represented in the act of swimming round the rosette, and these again are surrounded by a border of lotus bells united by a curved line. The five bases of Thmuis, and the Giza Museum, are of silver. They form part of the treasure of the temple, and had been buried in a hiding place, where they remain till our own day. We have no indication of their probable age, but whether they belong to the Greek or the Theban period, the workmanship is purely Egyptian. Of one vessel, only the cover is left, the handle being formed of two flowers upon one stem. The others are perfect, and are decorated in repoussé work with lotus lilies and bud and blossom, figure 285. The form is simple and elegant, the ornamentation sober and delicate, the relief low. One is, however, surrounded by a row of ovoid bosses, figure 286, which project in high relief, and somewhat alter the shape of the body of the vase. These are interesting specimens, but they are so few in number that, were it not for the wall paintings, we should have but a very imperfect idea of the skill of the Egyptian goldsmiths. The pharaohs had not our commercial resources, and could not circulate the gold and silver tribute offerings of conquered nations in the form of coin. When the gods had received their share of the booty, there was no alternative but to melt the rest down into ingots, fashion it into personal ornaments, or convert it into gold and silver plate. What was true of the kings held good also for their subjects. For the space of at least six or eight centuries, dating from the time of Amos I, the taste for plate was carried to excess. Every good house was not only stocked with all that was needful for the service of the table, such as cups, goblets, plates, ewers, and ornamental baskets chased with figures of fantastic animals, figure 287, but also with large ornamental vases which were dressed with flowers and displayed to visitors on gala days. Some of these vases were of extraordinary richness. Here, for instance, is a crater, the handles modeled as two papyrus buds, and the foot as a full-blown papyrus. Two Asiatic slaves in sumptuous garments are represented in the act of upheaving it with all their strength, figure 288. Here, again, is a kind of hydria, with a lid in the form of an inverted lotus flanked by the heads of two gazelles. Figure 289. The heads and necks of two horses, bridled and fully caparisoned, stand back to back on either side of the foot of the vase. The body is divided into a series of horizontal zones, the middle zone being in the likeness of a marshland, with an antelope coursing at full speed among the reeds. 2. Enameled cruets, figure 290, have elaborately wrought lids, one fashioned as the head of a plumed eagle, and the other as the head of the god best flanked by two. Vipers, 
Figure 291. But foremost among them all is a golden centerpiece offered by a viceroy of Ethiopia to Amenhotep III. The design reproduces one of the most popular subjects connected with the foreign conquest of Egypt. Figure 292. Men and apes are seen gathering fruits in a forest of dong palms. Two natives, each with a single feather on his head and a striped kilt about his loins, lead tame giraffes with halters. Others, apparently of the same nationality, kneel with upraised hands, as if begging for quarter. Two Negro prisoners lying face downwards upon the ground, lift their heads with difficulty. A large face with a short foot and a lofty cone-shaped cover stands amid the trees. 78. The craftsman who made this piece evidently valued elegance and beauty less than richness. They cared little for the heavy effect and bad taste of the whole, provided only that they were praised for their skill, and for the quantity of metal which they had succeeded in using. Other vases of the same type, pictured in the scene of presentations to Ramesses II, and the great temple of Abu Simbel, bury the subject by showing buffaloes, running in and out among the trees, in place of lead giraffes. These were costly. Playthings wrought in gold, such as the Byzantine emperors of the ninth century, accumulated in their palace of Magnora, and which they exhibited on state occasions in order to impress foreigners with a profound sense of their riches and power. When a victorious pharaoh returned from a distant campaign, the vessels of gold and silver which formed part of his booty figured in the triumphal procession, together with his train of foreign captives. Vases in daily use were of slighter make and less encumbered with inconvenient ornaments. The two leopards which serve as handles to a crater of the time of Thothan's three figure 293 are not well proportioned neither do they combine agreeably with the curves of the vase but the accompanying cup figure 294 and a cruet belonging to the same service figure 295 are very happily conceived and have much purity of form these vessels of engraved and repoussé gold and silver some representing hunting scenes and incidents of battle were imitated by Phoenician craftsmen, and, being exported to Asia Minor, Greece, and Italy, carried Egyptian patterns and subjects into distant lands. The passion for precious metals was pushed to such extremes under the reigns of the Ramesides that it was no longer enough to use them only at table. Ramesses II and Ramesses III had thrones of gold not merely of wood plated with gold but made of the solid metal and set with precious stones. These things were too valuable to escape destruction, and were the first to disappear. Their artistic value, however, by no means equaled their intrinsic value, and the loss is not one for which we need be inconsolable. Orientals, men and women alike, are great lovers of jewelry. The Egyptians were no exception to this rule not satisfied to adorn themselves when living. With a profusion of trinkets, they loaded the arms, the fingers, the neck, the ears, the brow, and the ankles of their dead with more or less costly ornaments. The quantity thus buried in tombs was so considerable that even now, after thirty centuries of active surge, we find from time to time mummies which are, so to say, cuirassed in gold. Much of this funerary jewelry was made merely for show on the day of the funeral, and betrays its purpose by the slightness of the workmanship. The favorite jewels of the deceased person were, nevertheless, frequently buried with him, and the style and finish of these leave. Nothing to be desired. Chains and rings have come down to us in large numbers, as indeed might be expected. The ring, in fact, was not a simple ornament, but an actual necessary Official documents were not signed, but sealed, and the seal was good in law. Every Egyptian, therefore, had his seal, which he kept about his person, ready for use if required. The poor man's seal was a simple copper or silver ring. The ring of the rich man was a more or less elaborate jewel, covered with chasing and relief work. The bezel was movable, and turned upon a pivot. 
It was frequently set with some kind of stone engraved with the omens. Emblem or device, as, for example, a scorpion, figure 296, a lion, a hawk, or a cynocephalus ape. As in the eyes of her husband his ring was the one essential ornament, so was her necklace in the estimation of the Egyptian lady. I have seen a chain in silver which measured 63 inches in length. Others, on the contrary, do not exceed two or two and a half inches. They are of all sizes. In patterns, some consisting of two or three twists, some of large lengths, some of small lengths, some massive and heavy, others as light and flexible as the finest. Venetian filigree, the humblest peasant girl, as well as the lady of highest rank, might have her necklet, and the woman must be poor indeed whose little store comprised no other ornament, no mere catalogue of bracelets, diadems, collarettes, or insignia of nobility could give an idea of the number and variety of jewels known to us by pictured representations or existing specimens. Pectorals of gold cloisonne work inlaid with vitreous paste or precious stones, and which bear the car touches of a menemhat too, usertesen too, in usertesen i.e. Figure 297, exhibit a marvelous precision of taste, lightness of touch, and dexterity of fine workmanship. So fresh and delicate are they we forget that the royal ladies to whom they belong have been dead, and their bodies stiffened, and disfigured into mummies, for nearly five thousand years. At Berlin may be seen the prior of an Ethiopian Candace, at the Louvre we have the jewels of Prince Sar, at Giza are preserved the ornaments of Queen Ahotep. Ahotep was the wife of Kames, a king of the 17th dynasty, and she was probably the mother of Amis I, first king of the 18th dynasty. Her mummy had been stolen by one of the robber bands which infested the Theban necropolis towards the close of the 20th dynasty. They buried the royal corpse till such time as they might have leisure to despoil it in safety, and they were most likely seized and executed before they could carry that pretty little project into effect. The secret of their hiding place perished with them till discovered in 1860 by some Arab diggers. Most of the objects which this queen took with her into the next world were exclusively women's gear, as a fan handle plated with gold, a bronze gilt mirror, mounted upon an ebony handle enriched with a lotus and chased gold, figure 298. Her bracelets are of various types. Some are anklets and armlets, and consist merely of plain gold rings, both solid and hollow bordered with plated chainwork and imitation of filigree. Others are for wearing on the wrist, like the bracelets of modern ladies, and are made of small beads and gold, lapis lazuli, carnelian, and green felspar. These are strung on gold wire in a checker pattern. Each square divided diagonally in halves of different colors. Two gold plates, very lightly engraved with the car touches of almost eye, are connected by means of a gold pen, and form the fastening. A fine bracelet in the form of two semicircles joined by a hinge, figure 299, also bears the name of Amos I. The make of this jewel reminds us of cloisonne enamels. Amos kneels in the presence of the god Seb and his acolytes, the genii of Sop and Honu. The figures and hieroglyphs are cut out in solid gold, delicately engraved with the furin and stand in relief upon a ground surface filled in with pieces of blue. Pace and lapis lazuli artistically cut. A bracelet of more complicated workmanship, though of inferior execution, was found on the wrist of the queen, figure 300. It is of massive gold, and consists of three parallel bands set with turquoises. On the front a vulture is represented. With outspread wings, the feathers composed of green enamel, lapis lazuli, and carnelian, set in cloisons of gold. The hair of the mummy was drawn through. A massive gold diadem, scarcely as large as a bracelet. The name of Amos is encrusted in blue paste upon an oblong plaque in the center, flanked at each side by two little sphinxes which seem as if in the act of keeping watch over the inscription, figure 301. Round her neck was a large, flexible gold chain, 
finished at each end by a goose's head reversed. These heads could be linked one and the other, when the chain needed to be fastened. The scare bees penned into this chain is encrusted upon the shoulder and wing sheaths with blue glass paste rayed with gold, the legs and body being in massive gold. The royal Pereira was completed by a large collar of the kind. Known as the Usk, figure 302. It is finished at each end with a golden hawk's head inlaid with blue enamel, in. Consists of rows of scrolls, four-petaled florets, hawks, vultures, wing. Urii, crouching jackals, and figures of antelopes pursued by tigers. The whole of these ornaments are of gold repoussé work, and they were sewn. Upon the royal winding sheet by means of a small ring soldered to the back of. Each. Upon the breast, below this collar, hung a square jewel of the kind known. As pectoral ornaments, figure 303. The general form is that of a nose, or shrine. On the stands upright in a papyrus bark, between Amen and Ra, who pour the water of purification upon his head and body. Two hawks hover to right and left of the king, above the heads of the gods. The figures are outlined in cloisons of gold, and these were filled in with little plaques of precious stones and enamel, many of which have fallen out. The effect of this piece is somewhat heavy, and if considered apart from the rest of the purr, its purpose might seem somewhat obscure. In order to form a correct judgment, we have, however, to remember in what fashion the women of ancient Egypt were clad. They wore a kind of smock of semi-transparent material, which came very little higher than the waist. The chest and bosom, neck and shoulders, were bare, and the one garment was kept in place by only a slender pair of braces. The rich clothed these uncovered parts with jewelry. The youth's color half hid the shoulders and chest. The pectoral mass the hollow between the breasts. Sometimes even the breasts were covered with two golden cups, either painted or enameled. Besides the jewels found upon the mummy of Queen Ahotep, a number of arms and amulets were heaped inside. Her coffin, namely, three massive gold flies hanging from a slender chain, nine small hatchets, three of gold and six of silver, a golden lion's head of very minute workmanship, a wooden scepter set in gold spirals, two anklets, and two poignards. One of these poignards, figure 304, has a golden sheath and a wooden hilt inlaid with triangular mosaics of carnelian, lapis lazuli, felspar, and gold. Four female heads in gold repoussé form the pommel, and a bull's head. Reverse covers the junction of blade and hilt. The edges of the blade are of massive gold, the center of black bronze damascene with gold. On one side is the solar cartouche of Amis, below which a lion pursues a bull, the remaining space being filled in with four grasshoppers in a row. On the other side we have the family name of Amis and a series of full-blown flowers issuing one from another and diminishing towards the point. A point art found at Mycenae by drive. Schliemann is similarly decorated, the Phoenicians, who were industrious. Copies of Egyptian models probably introduced this pattern into Greece. The second point art is of a make not uncommon to this day in Persia and India. Figure 305. The blade is of yellowish bronze fixed into a disc shaped hilt of silver. When wielded, this lenticular 79 disc fits to the hollow of the hand the blade. Coming between the first and second fingers, of what use, it may be asked, were all these weapons to a woman and a dead woman? To this we may reply that the other world was peopled with foes Typhonian genii, serpents, gigantic scorpions, tortoises, monsters of every description against which it was incessantly needful to do battle. The poignards placed inside the coffin for the self-defense of the soul were Useful only for fighting at close quarters, certain weapons of a projectile kind were therefore added, such as bows and arrows, boomerangs made in hard wood, and a battle axe. The handle of this axe is fashioned of cedarwood, covered with sheet gold, figure 306. The legend of Amis is inlaid thereon in characters of lapis lazuli, carnelian, turquoise, and green felspar. The blade is Fixed in a cleft of the wood, 
and held in place by a plate work of gold wire. It is of black bronze, formerly gilt. On one side, it is ornamented with lotus flowers. Upon a gold ground, on the other, Amos is represented in the act of slaying it. Barbarian, whom he grasped by the hair of the head. Beneath this group, Menchu. The Egyptian war god, is symbolized by a griffin with the head of an eagle. N. Addition to all these objects, there were two small boats, one in gold and one in silver, emblematic of the bark in which the mummy must cross the river to her. Last home, and of that other bark in which she would ultimately navigate the waters of the west, in company with the immortal gods. When found, the silver boat rested upon a wooden truck with four bronze wheels, but as it was in a very dilapidated state, it has been dismounted and replaced by the golden boat, figure 307. The hull is long and slight, the prow and stem are elevated, and terminate in gracefully curved papyrus blossoms. Two little platforms surrounded by balustrades on a panel grounder at the prow and on the poop, like quarterdecks. The pilot stands upon the one, and the steersman before the other, with a large oar in his hand. This oar takes the place of the modern helm. Twelve boatmen in solid silver are. Rowing under the orders of these two officers, Kames himself being seated in. The center, hatchet and scepter in hand. Such were some of the objects buried. With one single mummy, and I have even now enumerated only the most remarkable among them. The technical processes throughout are irreproachable. And the correct face of the craftsman is in no wise inferior to his dexterity of. Hand. Having arrived at the perfection displayed in the poorer of Ahotep, the goldsmith's art did not long maintain so high a level. The fashions changed, and jewelry became heavier in design. The ring of Ramesses too, with his horses. Standing upon the bezel, figure 308, in the bracelet of Prince Sar, with his griffins and lotus flowers in cloisonne enamel, figure 309, both in the Louvre, are Less happily conceived than the bracelets of Amis. The craftsmen who made these ornaments were doubtless as skillful as the craftsmen of the time of Queen Ahotep, but they had less taste and less invention. Ramesses, too, was condemned either to forego the pleasure of wearing his ring, or to see his little horses damaged and broken off by the least accident. Already noticeable in the time of the 19th dynasty, this decadence becomes more marked as we approach the Christian era. The earrings of Ramesses IX and the Giza Museum are an ungraceful assemblage of filigree discs, short chains, and pendant urii, such as no human ear could have carried without being torn or pulled out of shape. They were attached to each side of the wig upon the head of the mummy. The bracelets of the high priest Panodum III, found upon his mummy, are mere round rings of Gold encrusted with pieces of colored glass and carnelian, like those still made by the Sudanese blacks. The Greek invasion began by modifying the style of Egyptian gold work, and ended by gradually substituting Greek types for native types. The jewels of an Ethiopian queen, purchased from Froni by the Berlin Museum, contain not only some ornaments which might readily have been attributed to pharaonic times but others of a mixed style in which Hellenic influences are distinctly traceable. The treasure discovered at Zagazig in 1878, at Kane in 1881, and at Damanhor in 1882, consisted of objects having nothing. Whatever in common with Egyptian traditions, they comprise hairpins, supporting statuettes of Venus, zone buckles, agraphs for fastening the peplum, rings and bracelets set with cameos, and caskets ornamented at the four corners, with little ionic columns. The old patterns, however, were still in request in remote provincial places, and village goldsmiths adhered indifferent well to the antique traditions of their craft. Their city brethren had meanwhile no skill to do up but make clumsy copies of Greek and Roman originals. In this rapid sketch of the industrial arts there are many lacunae. When referring Two examples, I have perforce limited myself to such as are contained in the best-known collections. How many more might not be discovered if one had leisure? To visit provincial museums, 
and trace what the hazard of sales may have. Dispersed through private collections. The variety of small monuments do too. The industry of ancient Egypt is infinite, and a methodical study of those. Monuments has yet to be made. It is a task which promises many surprises too. Whomsoever shall undertake it.